So this week I wanted to talk about Chisana, a non-monotheist religion, specifically in that way. Um, and just reading from the very top, the idea of God, God's spirits have been around for as long as, well, before there have been Homo sapiens. And as I say in the handout, uh, the we find in the Neanderthal uh, archaeological burials evidence that there was a belief in something supernatural at the very least. Um, we don't know what that was. Neanderthals didn't leave us a message about that, but they did leave grave goods. So there was a belief in the afterlife of some sort, et cetera. And some argue that there was an aesthetic also. So the idea of, of God, gods, and spirits have been around for at least in that sense, going back to the first evidence of that in the archaeological grave goods, 140,000 years, which is before Homo sapiens jumped on the scene. Um, and here's a point that I want to make. It's the second paragraph down. Whether God exists or not is an uninteresting question. Mm -hmm. People get all bent out of shape about it. And the fact of the matter is, in the end, you're going to have some theists arguing for, well, this is evidence of God, and then atheists saying, well, it's not. And ultimately, whether one is a theist or an atheist, it's about belief. And the reason is you can't test the hypothesis and you can't demonstrate it. You can't prove it. You can't prove a negative if it doesn't exist, as an example. So for the purposes of this discussion, we'll be focusing on God as a belief, specifically as a creator deity or any eternal, and here the term is eternal, divine personal being. Because in Buddhism, we do have deities. And so people will say, well, I'm a Buddhist, but I don't believe in, but I'm an atheist. But then you find them talking about Avalokitsavara. You find them talking about the Buddha field. Okay. Where does that fit into this process? To me, that's a more interesting question. Whether God exists or doesn't exist, really, you know, as, as, I, as I would say to some of my extremely theist relatives, um, well, if God exists, God doesn't really care what I think about him or her. And if God doesn't exist, it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> so from that I mean that's my personal take on it. Don't you know that's 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 not a, um, a, a I don't want to be confused by saying that's the Buddhist perspective. That's my perspective. So in the purposes of this discussion we're going to be focusing on God with a capital G Hashem another way of referring to it Allah another way of referring to it as a creator as an omniscient, as omnipotent entity, whatever we want to call that, okay? So the definition of God, gods, and other supernatural entities is a matter that's occupied people's thoughts and treatises for millennia. And ultimately, it becomes a personal issue. It becomes a, a, an individual's sense of what is what isn't and nothing nothing i'm going to do nothing anyone's going to say well people people's ideas change over time i won't i won't say that they don't people's ideas do change over time on the other hand it really is a matter of personal perspective if for lack of a better term and i don't see as a buddhist priest i don't see a reason to even go into that place. If somebody asks me, what is my belief? Well, I can remember being um, going, to the, going to the synagogue and talking to the rabbi and asking the rabbi, do you believe in God? And the rabbi said to me, some days I do, some days I don't, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I think that that was, that was his personal take on it. 
Buddhism is sometimes called an atheistic religion, but atheism, as it's defined, <coughs> is an absence of belief in the existence of deities, period. It's a rejection of the belief that any deities exist. Non-theistic, which is what Buddhism is, is more to the point. God, specifically a monotheistic God, is not addressed in the Buddha Dharma. As a matter of fact, as I say down below, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, when asked about God, in this case, in reference to a creator, he remained silent. He didn't say a word. He didn't say yes. He didn't say no. He kept his mouth shut. And I found that one of the points that um, you find deities in many forms in Buddhism, um, and I give the example of Amida or Avalokitesavara, uh, Peter Harvey calls what Buddhists' deity um, recognition is transpolytheistic, which I find is a really interesting term, transpolytheistic. In other words, there are many deities. These are transformative beings. Um, and here's to the point, I think, when we're talking about Buddhism. Buddhist ontology follows the doctrine of dependent origination, whereby all phenomena arise in dependence on other phenomena. Hence, no primal unmoved mover could be acknowledged or discerned. Gautama Buddha in the early Buddhist text is also shown as stating that he saw no single beginning in the universe, hence there is no creation being. And furthermore, he maintains that there are many universes and one doesn't necessarily what goes on in those other universes. So he wasn't just covering his butt. He was really sort of... Um, providing a mechanism whereby, and, and I'm, now I'm, I'm going back to the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, the people that would have been joining his Sangha were coming from a, from a Vedic background in which there are many gods and goddesses, divine beings of one sort or another, Vishnu, Shiva, uh, Ganesh, et cetera, et cetera. Had he said initially, well, there are no deities, these people have said, what are you, absolutely bonkers? You're crazy. <laughs> so he had to sort of look at the, the situation and speak to everyone and make it as inclusive as he could. I think that that's an important thing to remember. From a Theravada perspective, for those who are theists, I thought it would be interesting to go back to a, a Theravada perspective. I'm going to read this. This is a quote. Theism, however, is regarded as a kind, kind of common teaching insofar as it upholds the moral efficacy of actions. Hence, a theist who leads a moral life may, like anyone else doing so, expect a favorable rebirth. He may possibly be even be reborn in a heavenly world that resembles his, his own conception of it, though it will not be of eternal duration as he may have expected. And I think the end of that is really important. It's to say that the individual who has passed, according to this Theravadan uh, teacher, um, may even be reborn into a heavenly realm much as that person expects, it's just it's not going to last because nothing is person, nothing is perpetual, nothing is eternal, plain and simple. So the question then comes: How do Buddhists consider the divine? For the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to break it into two categories. Excuse me while I just take a sip. In the first category. Deities such as Kishtagarbha are more like archetypical symbols than supernatural creatures. And this is important in Mikyo or es esoteric practices. 
No phenomena have objective or independent existence. Nothing is really separate or independent from everything else. So one view of the deities is as archetypes. The second is, and this two quotes that are coming from here, one, one quote and then one paraphrase. Henry James, um, anyone who has read Henry James, a 19th century uh, writer, whose a single sentence was worth several paragraphs, reading him is not the easiest thing in the world today, uh, wrote, consciousness ranging from meditation to nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide was very big as a, uh, in the 19th century, by the way. Uh, consciousness ranging from meditation to nitrous oxide and concluded that our normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it departed from it, the flimsiest of screens, there lies a potential form of consciousness entirely different. In other words, Henry James in the 19th century, and what's, what's interesting about this, what's really fascinating about this, this represents what philosophers are currently examining today. That what we view as consciousness does not reside within the brain. Consciousness resides all around us. And furthermore, <coughs> consciousness is conditioned by the environment that it's in. I'm not even getting into pan, uh, what do you call panpsychic phenomena. That's a different discussion. But just the consciousness itself now, and, and by the way, the people that are biggest in this area, looking at consciousness as something beyond just the, the neurobiological process that goes on within the brain, are mathematicians. They're the ones who are leading that, this particular uh, discussion. They tend to be mathematicians. This is, and then this is not outlandish metaphysical conjecture. There is such a thing as pure contemplative awareness, but our evolved met mental machinery and its normal working mode is harnessing that awareness to specific, specific ends. And we find that particular quote by right in the evolution of God, who examines God and consciousness. So those are the two ways to look at it from a Buddhist perspective. One way that I would argue is what is often utilized in Mikyo practices, and that is as an archetype, what does Yakshin Yorai represent? Yakshin Yorai represents healing medicine. That's the medicine Buddha, uh, et cetera. Um, that's an archetype. That represents something that we can relate to. And we might ask for assistance from that archetypical um, being, if you will, not as a separate external being, but what it does to our, our own process. And then the second way uh, is the, what I was talking about in terms of consciousness, which is the consciousness that we have in the mundane world as we're having this discussion now may be different than a consciousness when we're addressing a God or a spirit, meaning bodhisattvas, heavenly beings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, and I'm gonna sort of finish this up a little bit just by, and then open it up to questions and, and, and comments, et cetera. And that's the last line on here. The Buddhist path is, how, is about how one conducts one's life, how we incorporate loving kindness and compassion into our daily existence and adhere to the three marks of existence the four level truths, et cetera. That's the point. Buddhism is not about worshiping any entity. It's about how do we conduct our lives. And I think that that is more specifically to the point about why Shakyamuni Buddha, when asked about gods, et cetera, kept his mouth shut. What am I going to have to say about it? For a whole host of reasons that we've we already discussed. So, with that, I'm going to open it up for discussion. Anybody have any questions, comments, et cetera? What are the three marks of existence? Um, 
The question was, if you didn't hear, what are the three marks of existence? And the three marks of existence are dukkha, that life is discontentedness and suffering, that um, that which, that in, impermanence, that everything is impermanent, everything is change. And the third thing has to do with the lack of anatta, the lack of a eternal personal self, that those are the three marks of existence. Sometimes people will make a fourth and that's shunyata. Other times the third becomes shunyata. And the reason there is no self is because of shunyata or the emptiness of uh, inherent meaning in anything except the absolute. And the absolute is, yeah, and, and here we run into a, an issue, is the absolute eternal or the absolute is not eternal? No, I'm not going to attempt to answer that at the moment. Does that answer your question? Yes. Oh, thank you. What other questions or comments or thoughts do we have? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so Ikkyo practitioners, when they're uh, doing what they do with the various uh, uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, are seeing those as archetypes? That's one way to interpret it. In other or, words... Um, um, I, I thought you were done. Go ahead. Or what? Or they, uh, or they perceive it as uh, as a realities. What's reality? <laughs> what do you mean by reality? That uh, that outlook you just far really exists. Well. Now, now you're getting now you're getting into some deep weeds. <laughs> the reality is that Avalokites the, the reality is that Avalokites really exists if it exists for you. I'm asking how make you. I, that's my that's my response. How does it exist for you? I mean, a chala you requested a chala come over to assist you during the goma, mm -hmm. as an example. Now, do you think that there is a separate entity, external entity, that is coming over to do that? Or do you see that you're marshalling the forces that are inherent in that achala? I can't speak for all Mikio practitioners, but I can speak for me. And for me, I see it both as the archetype but as I'm doing it, I feel a transformation taking place, a real transformation. Now, we can get into a whole discussion. Is, is, is that transformation that, you're, that one is experiencing when it's me or somebody else, is that transformation um, a type of hallucination, as an example? You know? what, and, but then again, we get into the whole thing. What is the reality? I don't think that we have a, a really good grasp on that, except the reality of shunyata, that everything is empty of inherent meaning. That's the only reality that I hold to. Everything else is negotiable, if you will. Go ahead, go ahead, your um, no, it just it makes me think of like the archetype makes me think of um, you know, and my very surface understanding of, of esoteric Buddhism, but but that that the chala becomes an avenue towards uh, um, Mahabharatana. So mm -hmm. they're more uh, the the deity of worship that we call it that um, is a manifestation of Dainichi Yodai, of Mahabharatana. So they're acting as an intermediary, mm -hmm. as a way to become closer to the 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 root Buddha. You know. At, at, if, if the achala or the image is as an emanation or as an archetype as one of one aspect of Mahabharatana that we're using as a way, as a vehicle, vehicle, vehicle. Well, there, there is that. And then there's two ways to look at it within that. And Tendai and Shingonshu have a slightly different view. It's my understanding. Mm -hmm. Tendai Shu is as you're explaining it, but do you take on the qualities or you do take on the very essence? 
mm. of, in this case, the uh, Chawa. Mm. Ichishima Sensei, do you have any opinion about that? You might be muted. You're muted, Sensei. Well, this is a difficult point uh, of uh, uh, Buddhism, I think. But uh, uh, Buddhism, based upon the uh, such uh, relativities, uh, and as a result of relativities, uh, everything is sunyata, emptiness. But uh, emptiness temporarily manifest as a uh, being itself. So. Everything is changing is a point of Buddhism I, uh, that you suggested. And uh, so this is called the Shogyo Mujo, everything is changing. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, in Heian period, uh, eighth centuries or ninth century, early ninth century, uh, Kukai <laughs> made a song such, you know, alphabetical order of song, Iro, Irohani Hoheto. And uh, this is uh, really, even a beautiful color is cha um, changing. And uh, so I am also changing. This is a basic concept of Buddhism, I think. Sankara Anitya, everything is not eternal things. Everything is changing. But in this time of being, we survive in this world we should do, uh, what should I say? Uh, what is the uh, most uh, uh, ideal way of living? And then this is a point of Buddhism, I think. And they, uh, you mentioned uh, some deities like uh, Kristi Garba. This is a really uh, important belief in East Asia. And in our temple also we have image Zosong, uh, eternal life, uh, Kristi Garba. And Kristi Garba symbolizes, uh, you know, Garba is embryo. This is the embryo of the us. And, uh, and Kristi is, a, I think this is from Sanskrit, Kshanti, that is endurance. Endure uh, everything that is uh, symbolizing of the Kristi Garba. And, uh, uh, so, for instance, so when we look at, uh, uh, you know, us, you know, even the dirty things, garbage also turn into the nice soil. And that uh, transformation is uh, the symbolization of Christi Garba, I think. And uh, so uh, nature really uh, helps us to survive because of such a Christi Garba really the, that is ground itself. And when I returned from United States of America a long time ago, uh, I found that, you know, Japanese people, they're using so much herbicides to kill the uh, grasses. So I said, this is terribly bad things. So don't do it. And uh, since that time on our temple garden, I really return to uh, nature. And uh, really uh, now I think uh, as it is. So, so artificial things like uh, herbicides, et cetera, really killing uh, us, I think. Uh, this is quite uh, not a straight answer to you, but this is my opinion. Thank you, Sensei. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Maynard, do you have a question? Uh, my question is whether in your experience, you have found people who have developed a, a rich Buddhist practice uh, who seem to be uninterested in the various deities uh, or even treating the Buddha as a deity rather than as a teacher or physician. In other words, can the practice of the religion be successful if it's disembodied from 
all the traditions of deities that you might be able to speak to? That's my question. Okay. Somebody's phone is ringing. Yeah, so I don't mind. I'm getting rid of it right now. Okay. Um, to answer your question, I think that it's 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 very difficult, and that's the, very difficult to practice Buddhism without the deities that are associated with it. In other words, even someone who is considered a secular Buddhist, such as um, Stephen Batchelor in Great Britain, will utilize the various deities as archetypes. And he's a secular Buddhist. I don't know of, and, and if you look at certain, let's say Dogen uh, Zen, in that case, they are not deities, but the so-called patriarchs stand in much the position that a deity would otherwise fall into. So I think that it's very difficult to have a traditional religious practice without the recognition. And here I'm going to use something that, that is common to, I think, all the faith traditions. I think it's difficult to have faith tradition without the recognition that there is something that is greater than oneself. And there is something that is beyond oneself. I'm not saying it's necessarily transcendental but there is something that is beyond or greater than oneself. I think that that is a necessary element in any religious tradition, whether we refer to it as God or spirits or God's plural, whatever that may be. Um, did, did that answer your question, Maynard? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. But, but if there is no self, how can... This secular Buddhism isn't really a disembodiment of Buddhism, but really going to the essence of Buddhism, below well, the self, below the level, you know, of of, uh, of individuality. Well, I no? think I think I'm sorry, I didn't realize you. Go ahead, and realize you were not done. No, I am done. I, you know. Oh. It, it seems to me it's not a disembodiment of Buddhism but going to the essence of Buddhism without some of the outer trappings of it, but that you're using as archetypes, but still the, the basic teaching is, you know, the three marks of existence, right? Right. Right. Well, I mean, and I, I think that, that here we're going into going to the formal um, Tiantai teaching of the absolute and the provisional or the mundane and that we live in both simultaneously. And, and I think that if we could live in only the absolute, then that would be an embodied disembodiment, but we don't. We have to live also in the mundane so that that incorporates those various symbols. We'll use it that term. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? No? Okay. Then we'll call it there. And I'm going to ask the folks who are in the in here to go ahead and go on out to the hondo. And I just want to mention that here we're meeting weekly with many people meeting weekly in the hondo itself. Is this going to be for a month? Is it going to be for two weeks? Is it going to be for a year? All is impermanent. I think we've been talking about that a lot, huh? The COVID-19 virus has taught us that. In the last two years, living with an existential threat, and it has been an existential threat, the coronavirus with its many variations, we have learned many things that have been there all along and we're now either relearning them or learning them for the first time or just being made aware of something that we already know. And it's natural to think of many infectious agents such as viruses as an enemy. And we talk about the war on COVID or words of that effect. Yet we have lived with these microorganisms. We've evolved with them. 
They live in us and in our bodies throughout our lives. One of the most fascinating ideas is that of the, and this is, I've seen this in different forms, of the 10, oh, excuse me, of the of 100 billion organisms or 100 billion cells in our body, only 10 billion are of us that have our DNA. Stop and think about that. 100 billion cells in our body, 10 billion of which are of our DNA. That means the rest of them are bacteria, viruses, fungi, etc. Little mites that get in your eyebrow that you're not aware of that are microscopic, they're there. And boy, do they look really nasty if you see them under a microscope. Everybody would be freaked out. We would not be human in the ways that we are without these microorganisms. We share the world with them. And from an ev evolutionary perspective, we should keep in mind that the most successful viruses are ones that do not kill their host. That's true of viruses, that's true of bacteria, that's true of parasites in general. The most successful are those that do not kill their host. And as time goes by, the more virulent viruses become less deadly, but more communicable. That's how they survive and multiply. The COVID virus will undoubtedly follow this pattern. And I think that we're seeing it right now with the latest variant that's occurring. I don't know whether it's gonna be less or more virulent. I don't know how it's gonna respond. I don't intend to portend any of this. However, typically it will follow this pattern. And the virus, the vaccines that we've developed make use of this evolutionary tendency. That's what a vaccine is. It's using that evolutionary tendency. Humans develop vaccines, but then other humans have sought to short circuit the evolutionary tendency by creating anti-vaccine narratives, resulting in more virus variants, misinformation that has led to death, of many that could have been avoided. The virus is also part of the larger environment, excuse me, the vi yeah, the virus is also part of the larger environment, which has also been modified by humans that is leading to more devastation of both the macro world and the micro world. Evolution has also favored our species. We are very adaptive, human beings that is, not unlike the virus. Humans have the ability to thrive through change in new conditions, often at the expense of other species, plants, animals, and ecosystems. In our spiritual life, we tend to think in terms of development, growth, opening. We may even think in terms of transformation and transcendence. This requires personal change, openness to new ideas, or re-examination of old ideas. The word transformation suggests something radical, a new way of thinking, a new way of being. It signifies a change of consciousness that is deeper and more thoroughgoing than just form. Perhaps the personal and social changes we're currently experiencing will spur just such a change. So I'm gonna ask you to recognize that we've all been undergoing great changes in the last couple of years. Change does not always imply something negative. The changes that we've been undergoing may be the spur to allow someone else to grow spiritually in a way that they would not have grown otherwise. And that we should look at the changes that are taking place and say, how do we make the best of the new environment? That's one of the things perhaps that COVID-19 has taught us.
and I thank you all very much.